in the box. And I invite you to turn with Larry to Philippians 2, 12 through 18, and Larry Young will be reading. When Sheila sent this scripture to me, I started reading through it, and I realized immediately that my grandmother had quoted part of this passage to me. And when you get down to verse 14 here, you will see what I mean. Because she had a saying, and that saying was, complaining does no good, stop it. <laughs> and so that's reinforced here when we get to verse 14. Let me start verse 12 of chapter 2. So then, my beloved, just, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. God's word for us for today. Thank you, Larry. Would you join me as I ask a blessing on Pastor Mark this morning? Lord, Heavenly Father, we just uh, ask you to fill Pastor Mark with your Holy Spirit this morning. Quiet his mind and heart of all the things that's gone on the past week, Lord, and just uh, bring forth this message that you placed on his heart, Lord. Open our minds and hearts to hear this message in the manner in which it's pervaded, Lord, and bless us because we've heard it. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing on in this series, How to Be a Christian and Still Enjoy Life. That's, uh, to me, the exciting part about being a Christian. As so many people think of Christianity and think, well, that's a boring life. I don't want to do that. But in reality, we know that it can be an exciting life and that we are meant to enjoy life. Our key question today is, what should be our response to the gift of salvation? You notice I say gift of salvation. It's a gift from God to each one of us that we may have salvation. So based on the fact that we know we've been given this incredible gift, what do we do with it? Our key idea is this. Living with integrity should be one of our responses to the gift we have received. Living with integrity. That, I say it's just one because I often say one of our responses is that we should be serving the Lord or we should be worshiping the Lord. So another one is that we should be living out our faith. Our key scripture comes from Philippians 2, 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so I'll revisit Philippians, but I want to start off by reading possibly a familiar verse to you all. It's the analogy that Jesus gives, the parable about the narrow and the wide gates. And this is what Jesus said. Uh, this is in Matthew 7, starting in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. 
You notice the wide road is the road everybody wants to take. They can look down the wide road and they can see a flat path, no obstructions. It's the easy road. In life, it is the easy road. It's the high road. But then we know there's a narrow path that fewer people take. And it's a little more difficult, a little more treacherous. But in the end, it leads to life. I want you to think about this analogy. I, I played it for the deacons yesterday. And it's from Francis Chan, a, a teacher, an author, uh, a great, um, great teacher too. And uh, he gave this analogy. Imagine if I tell my boys, go clean your room. They go up to their room. They come down, back downstairs and said, Dad, here's what I did. Um, I studied about how to clean my room. I would say, sons, get back up and clean your room. An hour later, they come down and say, Dad, here's what I did. I prayed about cleaning my room. Son, get back up there and clean your room. An hour later, he comes down and says, Dad, I learned how to say clean your room in Greek and Hebrew. Son, get up there and clean your room. An hour later, he comes and says, Hey, I got together with my friends and we were discussing cleaning our rooms. At some point, I'm going to say, let me go with you and we're going to make sure your room is clean. At some point, you take all the knowledge, you take everything that God is prompting you with, and you do something with it. You actually clean your room. You see, all those things that my boys would be doing, praying, studying, learning, meeting with others, those are all great things. They should absolutely happen. But at some point, I'm going to expect my boys to clean their room. We read Scripture. We pray. We meet together. But at some point, God from heaven is saying, now do something with it. And so this is a challenge for all of us. How do we take what we're learning and apply it? How do we make the rubber meet the road? You see, the wide road is easy. It's comfortable. Maybe on the wide road, we're not convicted of anything. We can sit in church and not be convicted of a thing we hear. The wide road is comfortable. You know what? It's entertaining as well. And it can be a denial of Jesus' teaching. But we know we need more to grow, don't we? We need more. It comes time that we need to clean our room. And so we go to Philippians, and I like to remind people Paul was writing this in prison. Sometimes we get to going and we, we forget that what he's writing, he's actually currently living, uh, e even to the nth degree, right? He is doing it to perfection. And so he's writing to the people of Philippi, and he says, So then, my beloved. When Paul says, my beloved... He means it. He's not being trite. He's not being funny. He is telling them they really mean a lot to Him. My beloved, just as you have always obeyed. This gives us a clue to the people of Philippi that they actually listened to what God said in the Bible. They always obeyed you notice always they always 
obeyed. He thinks highly of these people, and he knows that they're reading Scripture and that they're trying. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. You know, as a leader, it's important to understand how how the people that are following you are acting not just when you're around, but when you're not around is even more important. And we know that the, the definition of integrity is who you are when no one's watching. Integrity is important. And he's saying that you have obeyed even when I'm not around. Way to go. Keep it up. But he needs to challenge them a little bit. And he says, now work out your salvation. Wait a minute. Work out your salvation. Does that mean that he's promoting works-based righteousness? Some of you are like, "Uh, I don't know what that is. It's earning your way to heaven. Is he saying that you have to do certain things, that you need to work so that you may have your salvation. But we know that isn't the case. That in Ephesians uh, 1 or 2, 8, Ephesians 2, 8, he says, this is the same writer, this is Paul, saying, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. There it is. We know salvation is, is a gift from God. And it's by grace, through faith, that you've been saved. That is at the foundation of the Protestant faith. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, if, if you're able to earn your way, then you're going to boast all about it. But we know that we're incapable of doing what it takes to be saved. And so, here he continues. He's saying, work out your faith with fear and trembling. Is it truly fear and trembling? Should we be scared of God? Well, to some extent, we get comfortable when we say God is our friend, God is our buddy, but we have to understand that God is sovereign and that He's all-powerful and He is the judge. But, in this instance, the Phillips translation of the Bible, which is a Bible not many people use much anymore, I thought he got it right. He said that it was one of awe and respect and responsibility. It's having an awe of God. Have you ever had someone pay for a meal and you've just been tremendously blessed and you you want to pass it on? That's what he's talking about. That you've been so blessed with the gift of salvation that you know you need to pass it on to someone else. That you need uh, to keep working at your faith with fear and and trembling, in awe and responsibility. For it's God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. He's saying now that you have your salvation, you're ready to pass it on, you're ready to act out your faith in everyday life. Here in Philippians 1.6, just prior, he says, For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That verse I have underlined, and it means a lot to me. God doesn't expect perfection from us. Because He started a good work in us and He's going to be faithful to complete it. I shared this story at the first service, 
when we were meeting with Dorothy, my mother-in-law, I heard a conversation she was having with someone. And she was in her final days. And, and they were talking to her and said, it's okay, you know, to go. Like, I know you're weak and you're fragile. And she said, God is doing something in me. She knew God was doing that work and He was faithful to completion. God's been working in each one of our lives. And God is faithful. And you may not like it. It may not be comfortable. It may be convicting. But He's going to be faithful to complete it in you if you allow it. And then He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. In my comfort, I think I would have left this one out. If I wanted to be comfortable with myself, I would have left this verse out. But I'm preaching God's Word, and I know sometimes I need to hear things that He's challenging them to do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. He's not telling them that they have to be perfect, but they have to be trying. We talk about Christian perfection. What most people misunderstand is that that's what we're attaining for, but we don't achieve it until the end. And so here he's telling them to not grumble or dispute, because what that does is it leads to bad things that shouldn't happen to things like envy and strife. Instead, be striving to be blameless and innocent. Because we're children of God. And we're set in the context of a crooked and perverse generation. You know, when, when Christians are acting out their faith with integrity, when, when it's in the backdrop of a perverse generation, you know what we look like? We look like light in the midst of darkness. And so he said, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Have you ever met someone that is, just has pure integrity? Someone that you know will do the right thing even when no one else is standing up? It's refreshing. It's bright. They stand out in the world. And that's what Paul is challenging us to do. To hold fast. Colin preached his last message on standing fast, standing firm. And that's what we need to be doing in this generation. Is standing firm, holding fast. Holding fast is like when, when you're set and, and, and you're facing opposition, that you're digging your heels in and you're not going to move backwards, you're only going to move forward. And that's what we need to do is to dig our heels in, hold fast to the Word of life. He describes the Bible as the Word of life. This is life-giving, not life-taking. And I'm thankful for that. So we hold fast to what God has taught us and we move forward with it. So that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. When you take a stand, you, you won't ever um, regret it. God will bless you for it. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. He's saying, even if my life is a sacrifice, which up until then it really had been a sacrifice, he said it's worth it. I, 
those of you that know me, I, I love the game of baseball. There's a lot of strategy in it. But one of the things that confuses the casual observer of baseball is the sacrifice fly or the sacrifice bunt. In the game of baseball, scores generally aren't very high. So every run counts. And so if there's uh, one or two outs and there's a person on third, you want to get that person to third to home. And so you instruct your person to your player to hit it as deep as they can or lay down a bunt to where they either throw it to first um, or hold it. But once that outfielder makes the catch and the person on third tags up and runs home, you have a run. And the crowd cheers. But the casual observer may say, wait a minute, but the batter got out. Yeah, but we got a run. He sacrificed his out to get someone home. We're sacrificing as Christians so that we may bring another one home. That we may lead them to know Christ. And that they may receive the gift of salvation and we may see them again in heaven. And so Paul is saying, as I'm pouring out my drink offering as a sacrifice and service because of my faith, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. Remember, he's sharing his joy while he's where? In prison. Don't let that escape. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and then share your joy with me. I think that's a beautiful picture. We're sharing our joy, bringing other people to heaven. You share yours with me and I'll rejoice. And then I'll share mine with you and we'll rejoice all the more. Paul talks about joy and he's telling us <laughs> that it's in celebrating together. So I'm going to give you five signs of Christian integrity that we, we can extrapolate from this passage. One is, am I making any progress? When you stop, are you still at the elementary point? Have you grown since you first learned who God is? and who Jesus Christ was. Have you grown? Have you dug into Scripture? Has your prayer life grown to be able to grow in your life? The second thing is, is Christ really my King and Lord? 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16 says of Jesus Christ, which He will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only Sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. You hear how he speaks of the Lord. It's with great awe, great responsibility, and great respect. Is Christ really the King and Lord in my life? Do we rearrange our life for Him? Third, <laughs> am I easy to live with? No answers, Leanne. Because I'm guilty. Am I easy to live with? We know that he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. But I like a good debate, I enjoy it. Fourth, am I making an honest effort? Are you trying? Are you trying to grow in your faith? 
All he's asking for is an honest effort. And then the last thing, am I sharing the word of life? That's how Paul put it, the word of life. A word that we believe is life-changing, that is Jesus' words for us. And I find it interesting, we sometimes can talk ourselves out of sharing our faith, especially in the climate of today. You never know how someone's going to receive it, but I, I've, I think sometimes Satan will get into our head and say, yeah, but that person really doesn't want to hear about the Word of God. Uh, they're not really receptive. But I haven't met very many people that aren't receptive. Especially in the deepest time of need. They're looking for truth. That's all they're looking for. And when you can give it to them, they're so appreciative. I'm not saying everybody is. But don't let those words fall into your head. Because most people are receptive. Let me bring it home. How now shall I live? I'm going to leave you with ten things. I, I would call this a litmus test. You know, a simple test of yes or no. A simple test of a gauge on are we living with integrity? Are, are we living out the faith and the joy of our salvation? First, I'm honest and forthright. You can speak the truth, right? Just do it in love. I give any assignment or job my all. Who? Any? I'm loyal and devoted to my church. What about I keep my word? Let my yes be yes and my no be no. I'm totally committed. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm all in. I'm totally committed. By the way, if you're writing these down and you can't keep up, let me know. I'll print some out for you. I faithfully nurture my devotional life. When I go through one of my books, I find another one. I make sure my devotional life is front and center in my life. I have a sense of awe and responsibility toward God. Just like He challenged us to, that we're to work out our salvation with a sense of awe and responsibility toward God. Eighth, I resist complaining, being critical, and being contentious. Hmm. My life is blameless and pure. Again, it's not perfect, but you're making an honest attempt. I share the word of life with others. We can make lots of excuses. Well, I don't know enough. What if they ask a question that I don't know? Maybe I'm giving you some new questions. I should stop. But we can all talk ourselves out of sharing God's Word with other people. Maybe just learn one verse that you tell other people. Hey, I have read a great verse the other day, and this is what it said. People will want to hear it. Share the word of life with others. So those are things you can look at yourself and say, how am I doing on this? On a scale of 1 to 10, am I at a 1 or a 10? Where do I need to work on and grow? Man, I'm going to invite you to come up. I don't know where you're at today. Are you growing? Are you making an honest attempt? It's important for us to take our faith and to grow it, to nurture it, 
But then take the step where we're living it out. We're not just talking about cleaning our room. We're actually cleaning our room. We're not just talking about having faith, demonstrating God's goodness, but we're living it out. And we're showing people how good God is and how faithful He is. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of invitation. And when we do that, you can come. If you need prayer for anything, anything, please come and let me pray with you. It can be just you and I. You can also come to the altar and it can be you and God. The altar is always open. Maybe you've never accepted Christ and taken that first step and said, I want to put my faith and hope in the one that never changes. The one that has led to eternal life. You can come and I'll pray with you about that as well. Let's stand and sing.